This is the Kratom Science Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com, your source for all things Kratom. My guest is Dr. Walter Prezelik, originally from Johnstown, PA. Dr. Prezelik is a biomedical educator and researcher at Midwestern University in Chicago, where he served as chair of the Department of Pharmacology from 1997 till 2018. He's been studying Kratom since 2012. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, doing the podcast. And and how do you pronounce your last name? It's uh, pronounced progelic. Progelic, okay. Yeah. It's an old Ukrainian word that means really bad golfer. <laughs> but uh, you're a good rugby player, though, I, I, I see on your uh, Wikipedia page. Uh, well, I used to be. I'm paying the price after you know 22 years of that. I uh, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was in my 50s. Okay, I probably had it most of my life, and I played football for six years, rugby for 22 years. Wow! So I took a bit of a beating, but yeah. I never really got hurt in any of the sports. Uh, it was only when I got older that uh, things started deteriorating physically. Yeah. It happens to everybody, I guess. I guess so, yeah. Um, and, and you're originally from Johnstown? Yeah, near Johnstown. It was a little coal mining town near Johnstown. It's called Dunlow. Okay. It's a dying Rust Belt coal mining town. You have a background in osteo osteopathy? Is... It's, uh, osteopathic medicine is the uh, correct terminology. Okay. And uh, it's uh, it started out in the late 1800s as kind of an alternative approach to medicine. Uh, in the late 1800s, mainstream medicine, which we now call allopathic medicine, that's any MD is technically an allopathic physician. Uh, it was pretty bad in the late 1800s. Uh, it was before the uh, germ theory of infectious diseases was widely accepted. Mm. Uh, doctors were not used to using sterile or aseptic techniques. Some of the uh, drugs that were used in that era were actually pretty poisonous. Uh, things like strychnine was used as a drug. Oh, wow. Arsenic and mercury were used as drugs. And uh, the mainstream medicine was in such a bad state that uh, a physician named Andrew Taylor still came up with a new approach and he called it osteopathy. And he at first shunned the use of drugs and surgery. He focused on musculoskeletal aspects of medicine. So that was the origins of osteopathy um, in the late 1800s. And then over the years, osteopathic education and practice have changed that the osteopaths over the years won increased practice rights, which includes the ability to do surgeries and prescribe drugs. So really, since the mid-1950s, there really isn't that much difference between MDs and DOs, doctors of osteopathic medicine. Uh, so like I've been teaching pharmacology at first in Philadelphia at the osteopathic school there, and then here in Chicago. This is my 41st year of teaching. Uh, and trust me, what we teach the osteopathic students the same thing, the same things about drugs as we teach medical students. I, I teach at the University of Illinois as a part-time gig, and mm. uh, it's the same material. And DOs prescribe drugs, they do surgeries. Most people don't even know if their doctor is an MD or a DO. Did you become interested in, in medicine, maybe as an outgrowth of your interest in sports? No, no. It was, uh, as I think back, I remember in fourth grade in elementary school, one of my teachers uh, was asking students, what do you want to do when you grow up? And as she went around the room, I just blurted out, I want to be a scientist. So <laughs> somehow I got an interest in science at an early age. And my mom and dad, even though they were, my dad was a 
steel worker and coal miner. And my mom was the postmaster in our little town. Mm. And uh, they were really, they pushed me on the education front. I was always a pretty good student, never the top of the class, but never had any real troubles. And Mm -hmm. they encouraged me and helped me get through college. And they even helped me a bit in grad school, even though I had a stipend. It wasn't quite enough to live on in Philadelphia. So it was their support. And then when I did start pursuing my education, I had a lot of really good role models. I had a great high school science teacher in college. I had a couple of wonderful chemistry professors. And in grad school, I had a great mentor uh, who was a psychopharmacologist, Wolfgang Vogel. And my postdoc mentor, Benjamin Weiss, was another psychopharmacologist. All were great role models. So what made you become uh, interested in Kratom? Well, that that was like several lines led me to Kratom. First, I got a question from one of my clinical colleagues uh, here at Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he mentioned that a patient had asked him about Kratom. He asked me if I knew anything about it, and I really had never heard of it. Uh, So I started looking into the matter, and when I saw what Kratom was and saw some of the claims about its use, the fact that I was dealing with a lot of orthopedic issues and some pain issues, uh, I naturally was interested in it. And the more I read, the more interested I became. So I think it was 2012 when I finally published my first review article on Kratom. And uh, it's been cited very highly. It's like it was one of the first reviews on Kratom published in the the United States. There were several people, Chris McCurdy, me, uh, Oliver Grunman, who I know you've interviewed. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was about the same time we all got interested in this topic. And uh, it's a topic that's only been on the front burner in the United States for, you know, eight years or so. And, and you can tell, like, the, the studies are getting, there's more and more of them, but if you go back, you can't really find uh, oh, much, yeah. probably and before it, that 2012. I, there, are, there are a couple things from the 70s and 80s, but not much there, at all. There, there's actually stuff from the 1930s that oh, almost yeah. nobody cites. Uh, you know, I, I think what's happened is we've become reliant on, you know, computerized literature searches. It's... All the current journals are pretty much online and publications are available uh, through electronic media. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's happened is a lot of the older research work has been overlooked. I mean, it was indexed in things like the old Index Medicus, which was a bound volume that scientists would search by hand. a lot of the papers that were published in the early 1900s, even up to into the 1950s and 60s, have never really been entered into computerized databases. Huh. So a lot of those old papers uh, just go by the wayside. And a uh, few Kratom researchers have been rediscovering that old work. I just reviewed a paper where they had a very nice review of uh, Some of the the authors had a very nice review of some of the older literature, some of which I had never seen. Uh, It was quite quite a good review. Uh, The Pharmacology of Kratom from 2012, the one you did. Now, we we hear a lot about mitragynine and 7-hydroxymetragynine as the two main active alkaloids. Um, Can you explain what you know about some of the other alkaloids, like Speciosilatine, pananthine, yeah. speciol... Speciol... F- 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 <laughs> the pronunciation is a joke, especially yeah. for two guys with Pittsburgh accents. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, I actually... I, I have mainly focused my own attention on mitragynine and a little bit on 7 hydroxy mitragynine. Mm-hmm. I have not done any studies with the other compounds but uh there's a lot of interest in the other compounds and there are a couple of labs that are really digging into the you know uh 
biochemical pharmacology of these different compounds. Mm -hmm. And the big question in Kratom research is, what are the roles of the multiple compounds that are present in the natural leaf? Mm -hmm. uh, when a person consumes the leaf or teas made from the leaf, they're obviously consuming a lot of compounds beside mitragynine. And uh, how these compounds interact is something that's only beginning to be explored. I mean, they're still identifying new compounds. Uh, but the fact that National Institute of Drug Abuse is putting some money into this area now is a good development and progress is being made. So it's a very active area of research right now. Until Dr. McCurdy got the major funding, you know, the top lab in the world was probably in Malaysia. And uh, Darshan Singh is the head of that group. And they've been incredibly productive, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've had him on the podcast, too. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. I've never met him. I've co collaborated with him in writing and some uh ideas and we've been in email contact but when he was in the u.s i had a family issue come up so i couldn't travel to florida to meet with him we were mm. going to have a mini kratom summit in florida when he was visiting oh uh, okay yeah yeah he was on he was telling me how to pronounce uh he was like cat poem <laughs> like, uh well, it, kratom? it was funny i i <laughs> gave a, a presentation for a webinar with a group in Indonesia. And I think there were five different ways that different people pronounced Kratom. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah. I was the only one who presented in English, so I'm not sure what the other people were saying. This might be related to uh, osteopathy. A, a variety of chemical compounds have been isolated from kratom and shown it to exhibit opioid-like activity on smooth muscle systems. Is Would you explain yeah. what that means and how kratom affects okay. it? Okay, uh, yeah, you, you uh, mentioned that as a possible area you would be asking about. Yeah. Uh, what I mean by that is if anyone's ever used an opioid like uh, Vicodin, hydrocodone, uh, one of the big side effects is constipation. And it turns out there are opioid receptors in our gut, in the smooth mus on the smooth muscle cells of the gut and on neurons of the enteric nervous system, which regulates gut movement and motility. And uh, opioids like hydrocodone, which is in Vicodin, they bind to the opioid receptors and what that does is inhibits peristaltic movements of the bowel, so the bowel slows down. Well, that type of effect is common to all opioids, and scientists will study compounds for opioid activity by looking at their effects on smooth muscle, say from a rat, uh, intestinal smooth muscle, mm -hmm. and uh, opioids can relax some smooth muscle and contract others. So scientists can look at that and they can use opioid antagonists like naloxone to see mm -hmm. if opioid receptors are involved in the response to the unknown compounds that they're testing. Yeah. And so it, some of the compounds from Kratom act on opioid receptors in the bowel and they can cause constipation. Uh, that's what that refers to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and I've heard from a lot of people that say it does it does for them, and you know they just drink a lot of water to counter that. Um, yeah. Uh, I I think the study that you know I I helped Doctor Singh with the data and uh, writing up the results uh, when we looked at effects of opioid subjective effects of opioids versus. Uh, Kratom. The Kratom effects are definitely milder. The effects on the bowel were definitely milder than typical opioids. Yeah, and and uh, on the update to the pharmacology the, that um, you published in 2016, uh, it says, uh, based on all the evidence, it's clear that Kratom and its mitragynine constituents are not opioids, and they should not be classified as such. Yeah, that's uh, I, I, was, I probably overstated that a little bit, but it's a huge debate. Mm-hmm. 
that is still being kicked around in the Kratom community. And the term that most Kratom researchers have adopted is they refer to the mitragenines as atypical opioids. Yeah. And there are some people, most notably Jack Henningfield, who has been a huge uh, supporter of Kratom research and a Kratom advocate. Uh, Jack has recently made the argument that we shouldn't refer to these compounds as opioids at all because mm. the Kratom plant is not related at all to the opium poppy. Yeah. The compounds are chemically a different class of compounds. They're mainly indole or modified indole chemical structures. Their effects at opioid receptors are different, even though they can bind to opioid receptors, their effects are different than classic opioids. And, you know, the fact that a compound binds to an opioid receptor, I'm not so sure that makes it an opioid. The best example would be uh, naloxone, which is used to treat opioid poisoning. It obviously binds to opioid receptors and displaces the drugs that the people poison themselves with. And uh, so it binds to opioids receptors, but it's an opioid antagonist. So mm -hmm. it's not an opioid. Yeah, and they they seem to stress that because uh, you know, a, like a lay person would look and and see that the FDA considered as an opioid, and they might think, oh, well, this is uh, kind of like heroin or uh, oxycontin, and and uh, from a headline that says kratom is an opioid, you can't really uh, get a get a detailed understanding of the, of how it works on the receptors well, differently. Well, there's been some ramifications of that when the the, the government agencies have periodically use the term opioid in referring to Kratom, especially the FDA movement to schedule the mitragenines as schedule one substances. I think they're looking at the science finally. So uh, Yeah, and, and there was, well, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, there's a letter recently discovered from the HHS uh, assistant Health Secretary to the DEA rescinding his recommendation that Kratom be scheduled, and this was from 2018, and the uh, American Kratom Association just, through uh, Congressman Mark Pocan from Wisconsin, just yeah. got their hands on it. Um, so do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, that was a big development, and as a scientist who's been trying to look at Kratom from a scientific perspective, uh, I've been trying to be an unbiased observer. Yeah. But uh, the fact that that letter to rescind the request to schedule Kratom was pretty much not acknowledged or was even to a certain degree suppressed at the level of the FDA is a bit frustrating. Yeah. And uh, the fact that they were using the term opioid in the rationale to schedule Kratom in the first place, as you mentioned before, that had some ramifications. Um, some of the negative ramifications of the opioid argument which went on for the past two years, even though the move to ban was rescinded, it's had ramifications for Kratom users and Kratom marketers. Some of the marketers uh, have actually played up the opioid-like activity of Kratom, and yeah. some vendors market it as a legal high. Yeah, yeah. Claiming it's like an opioid in its effects. and. Uh, the vast majority of user reports are that Kratom's effects are not subjectively like opioids. Uh, the euphoric effects are very attenuated with uh, Kratom and Kratom compounds. Uh, they don't have the tendency to produce euphoria or depressed respiration like classic opioids. Yeah. So, and uh, some drug users, drug abusers, you know, they see, oh, a legal opioid, I'm going to try this. And there are people trying to get high by taking Kratom, mm -hmm. and they probably push the dosage envelope too high mm -hmm. and uh, get into overdose situations. 
I have never made the argument that Kratom is a totally safe drug. Mm -hmm. If it has any pharmacologic activity, which it clearly does, it's going to have side effects and toxicities and Mm -hmm. uh, people can be poisoned with it. And uh, the key thing though, is it's clear that Kratom is safer than most traditional opioids. And along those nine lines, um, do you know anything about how it might interact with uh, other drugs? Um, we, we've heard about um, these 44 deaths that the FDA claimed, but and then then we see that in most cases there was fentanyl involved, and in some cases there were other drugs involved. Yeah, the, some of the cases that were reported as kratom-related deaths, I mean, there were so many issues identified and the the other drugs that the people were using is certainly a big issue uh many of the cases the people had severe depression and there was one case it was actually a suicide but it was after the young man had used a kratom product and it was listed as a kratom related death even yeah. though the guy had attempted suicide several times earlier and yeah you know I, I, there was one case that I've heard of, but I haven't seen the report where the guy was shot while under the influence of Kratom and he didn't survive. Yeah. And it was listed as a Kratom related death. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that kind of stuff. As a scientist, uh, I, I find that kind of hard to deal with. You know, we need to look at these cases from a cleaner forensic standpoint. Do we have actual toxicology data on what the levels of mitragenine in the victim's tissues or blood was? Mm -hmm. uh, do we know what product the per person was using? Mm -hmm. uh, if we know what product the person was using, we could check and see if it was contaminated with other substances because there have been reports of Kratom products being adulterated. Then. Another thing that's missing in a lot of the overdose reports is what other drugs were, was the patient taking? And do they have blood levels or tissue levels on the other drugs? What kind of doses were they using? Uh, and the fact that there are so few studies on kratom in humans, almost nothing is known about drug interactions with kratom in people we just don't know those yeah. studies haven't been done i i wanted to ask you about this uh, uh covid covid pain case study where um a guy took uh kratom he was diagnosed with covid he took kratom and and it helped a lot with his uh pains and anxiety about the virus itself um it seems like this this points to a bigger public health issue as well because a, a lot of people COVID is actually creating thousands of chronic pain patients because some yeah. people have pain a few months after or six months after they still have pain um, yeah. and then, then there's a lot of mental health issues with the shutdown and and everything like that and a lot of chronic pain people are complaining now that they're being under prescribe their meds uh, be as a response to the opioid crisis. And um, I'm just wondering if you want to comment on uh, that case in particular. And, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Th that case is someone that I knew about, and they, they told me uh, that they tried Kratom. Uh, I've been open about my Kratom research here at Midwestern, and the person came forward and is a nice young man and uh, told me his story. And he had had previous experience using Kratom for both sports injuries, pain from sports injuries, and it's just an energy booster. And mm -hmm. uh, when he developed COVID, he had a, a lot of problems with a lack of energy and musculoskeletal pain. And uh, he, he was depressed and just couldn't function. and he decided to try Kratom on his own and uh, it seemed to help him. Uh, so I put him in contact with uh, Dr. Carasa in London, who is a clinical psychologist, I think, who actually interviewed him over the phone. And that was the basis of the case report.
And, uh, you know, the issue of pain being undertreated, that's something that that's the consequences, you said, of the opioid crisis uh, in 2015 or so, I think it was the CDC came up with new guidelines for prescribing opioids uh, for non-cancer chronic pain. And even though they were guidelines, they weren't absolute rules. A lot of states and clinicians and practice groups and healthcare systems have taken those guidelines and interpreted them as absolute rules. And a lot of docs are just refusing to prescribe opioids. Uh, a lot of states has re have restricted opioid prescribing. You know, some states, the initial prescription can only be a few days supply. And then the person, if they want to continue on the drug or the physician wants to continue them on the drug, they have to be referred to a pain management specialist or a pain clinic. And the problem is those clinics are few and far between. And with COVID going on, it's hard for anyone to get treated for non-COVID problems right now. And uh, a lot of pain patients, I, I think, are being undertreated for their pain, which creates mm -hmm. some more demand for Kratom. Now, with all that said, even though access to prescription opioids has decreased in recent years, if you look at opioid overdose deaths, they're still going up through the roof. And the only explanation is an increase in street use of, or use of street opioids. Yeah. And the big crisis now is the fact that these fentanyl derivatives keep showing up. And there now is, my understanding, the number one cause of drug overdose deaths. And some of these fentanyl derivatives, like carfentanil, are just so powerful. Uh, it's it's roulette if, if when a patient takes a drug containing those substances, uh, t you know, they might think they're taking heroin, but if it's laced with fentanyl or carfentanil, they're going to get much more of an effect than they would have expected. Yeah, when they're taking prescribed drugs, they know exactly what's in it because they're regulated, they're on the market, and that's an issue with Kratom as well. Um, you did a uh, study of uh, Kratom and toxic metals, yes, um, yes. and these and these were just uh, purchased uh, around Chicago, uh, these Kratom samples. And yes. some, some of these, uh, I won't mention the company's name, but some of these were pretty popular companies, and you found a lot of... Uh, nickel and lead in 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 some of these kratom samples yeah those were the two most worrisome metals and i i, I did that in a follow-up to study I, I forget if it was the cdc or the fda who did the initial the study and put out a report a consumer warning about toxic metals in kratom and uh i was just curious i looked at the products that they had analyzed, and I have a background in heavy metal toxicology. So it was, you know, my two careers as a metal toxicologist and someone with an interest in Kratom coming together. And I was just curious. So I went to several head shops in the uh, western suburbs of Chicago, and, you know, I saw what products were being sold. And uh, I had talked to Kratom users and which products do you use? And I picked out 10 products and, you know, I, I bought them myself out of my own pocket uh, just because of legal ramifications and uh, funding for research uh, is limited. So I thought that part of the study, that's my contribution to science. Yeah. <laughs> but then we had the two issues. The one was toxic metals and at the same time, there were reports from federal agencies about their concern with Kratom being linked to outbreaks of salmonella. So mm. I collaborated with some of our microbiology faculty here, uh, and they tried to culture microbes from the Kratom samples. And we also assayed the Kratom samples for a panel of toxic metals. And the final thing we did was we actually measured levels of mitragynine and 7-hydroxy, which we didn't find in any of the samples. We didn't find enough 
seven hydroxymitraginine to matter. But all of the samples did contain mitraginine, which means they were derived from kratom. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, kind of troubling how uh, dirty the products were in terms of microbial contamination and metal contamination. And the microbes, we didn't find any salmonella, which was a good thing. Uh, the microbes mostly were benign uh, for most people, but the issue is what about immunocompromised people? Might some of the bacteria that are present be pathogenic in immunocompromised people? So that was a concern. Uh, back to the toxic metals, the metal that I'm most concerned about is lead. Mm. And the levels of lead in a few of the products, uh, if, if we represented the levels as micrograms per gram of uh, uh, product, and most people base their dose of kratom on the gram of product, on how many grams of product they're using. And uh, we estimated, you know, a dose of five to 10 grams a day, which is not unreasonable for heavy kratom users. Mm -hmm. Heavy users can get up to 20 or 30 grams yeah. a day pretty easily. Uh, with levels of like 10 grams a day ingestion, uh, that for some of the products would exceed the allowable daily intake of toxic metals, particularly lead. So there were a few of the products that I was really concerned about with lead. One good thing about this study, we did find a couple of products that had very low microbe burden, uh, and we didn't find much toxic metals in two of the products. And it turned out they were the most processed products. Uh, most of the products were simply dried, chopped leaf material in capsule form. Yeah. So, and the other positive note, before I published the paper, I looked at the American Kratom Association's list of uh, vendors and Kratom dealers that have agreed to follow uh, their recommended good manufacturing practices. And only one of the companies that makes the product that we found tested negative had signed and agreed to the American Kratom Association good manufacturing practices. Mm -hmm. All of the other products were from companies that had not agreed to those practices. So there is an uncontrolled uh, market out there where it's sort of a no man's land. Uh, company, some companies are selling products that are you know, not of really good quality and the consumer needs to beware of what they're buying. The levels of lead that you found, how, how much kratom would, have, would somebody have to ingest to, you said it was only five to 10 grams and some of these a day that would be toxic. Yeah, that would be, it, the, the thing is, like, these metals accumulate in the body. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying someone who uses kratom occasionally is going to be poisoned with lead. I'm more concerned about the chronic users who are using some of the not so high quality products that contain high levels of lead if they do this every day they are at risk of developing chronic lead poisoning yeah uh, and and i've heard of people you know with i asked uh, darshan singh about this uh, you know there's some people that say oh i was losing hair and i had to take this other supplement so i wouldn't lose hair and i was like wow yeah. i would not yeah. take kratom if it made me lose hair that's the last <laughs> that's the yeah, only I, thing i have left. i don't know how old you are but at, uh, at my age i can't afford to lose any <laughs> yeah i'm 44 and i still my hair yeah. is the only thing that's good everything else yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> but uh, he but Darshan Singh said that I don't even see that in Malaysia because we're getting kratom right off right off of the tree and and people are you know the stuff they make over there is fresh and it's not and he said it must be yeah, it must be because of the adulterants the whole, the whole question and it's something I'd love to look at but it would be a very hard study to do. Uh, in a scientific manner, where do the metals come from? And 
I don't have an answer for that. Some there's one paper I'm aware of, and I can't remember the name of the author, but they looked at kratom products from different parts of the world, and they tried to look at levels of metals in the kratom samples and correlate that with the metals that are common in soils from the different geographic regions of the world where the kratom samples came from. I'm not so sure about the quality of the study. I mean, there were clearly differences in metal levels in different kratom products, but I'm not so sure it's from the soil. Uh, in my paper, I did comment about you know possible sources and one of the confounding issues is that in the US, almost all of the kratom that's sold here comes from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And Indonesia, I'm not a geologist, but it is a volcanic group of islands, basically. Mm -hmm. And the volcanic soil, there's a lot of literature about metal contamination. So, you know, there's a chance it could come from the soil, but also, it could be the way the leaves are processed. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never been there and never observed this in person, but I've seen uh, film uh, representations of how kratom is processed. And uh, I've talked to people who have been there and seen, you know, it can be processed at the site. Uh, and some of the equipment that's used might not be up to modern food or drug processing standards. This ancient equipment yeah. could be leaching all sorts of metals. And the fact that I found nickel and chromium in the samples, those would clearly be possibly derived from the equipment that was used to process. Uh, I tried looking at the kratom samples under the microscope, but I even took a magnet to the microscope slide. I waved a magnet underneath to see if I could identify any medical particles, thinking that if it came from the equipment, there might be, you know, fragments, tiny bits of metal yeah. present. And uh, I couldn't find anything with uh, the magnet experiment. That was uh, one that didn't work. But, uh, you know, who knows where the metals come from? It would be fascinating to look at. And the, the microbial issue, you know, that. What, one of the things I, I've talked to the botanist at University of Florida, I, I think his name is Brian Pearson, who I had a really interesting phone conversation with him when, be right before I published the metals paper. The whole issue of how Kratom grows and what are the factors that, you know, cause metals to appear in kratom? Is it absorbed from the soil? Is mm. it from the processing of the leaves? A more basic question is, uh, what causes the mitragyny to be formed? And, you know, it, it, there's the recent paper from Florida where they, I think you included that in your, uh, your podcast. Yeah, uh, oh, about when they grew kratom. Yeah, effects yeah. of nutrient fertility on growth and alkaloidal content. Yeah, we did that one, yep. Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. I didn't listen to the whole podcast, but one of the things that I thought of, and it, it, some of this came from talking with my microbiology colleagues here, is the microbiome that the plants are grown in might have an impact on what active compounds they produce. Why do plants produce, you know, why does tobacco produce nicotine? It's an insecticide. Mm -hmm. Why is kratom producing mitragyny? Uh, is it an antimicrobial? Uh, I've talked to some people who think it, they, it, they report that it might be an antifungal. Hmm. So could it be that the plant has to be exposed to the fungus? to produce the chemical defense mechanism, mm. mitragyny. There's the issue of how variable the alkaloidal content of kratom products are. Yeah. Uh, if they vary from one sample to another, or one strain of kratom to another, 
uh, might the microbial environment that those different plants were grown in, might that contribute to the difference in expression or levels of these uh, active compounds, which are probably pesticides? Yeah, that's interesting. Because we, we touched on that because it was mentioned in the paper, um, but we really didn't get into it because the metragenin content in, they say, in Thailand is like 66% of alkaloids, and then in Malaysia, it's only 38 or something, and then in the Philippines, they barely found any of them yeah. there. And, so. and the samples they tried growing in Florida, it's my understanding at first, they had very low levels of mitragenine and i don't know if they've found an answer how to get the plant to make more mitragenine yeah and more and, active chemicals i mean i've heard just from growers that it, it takes a couple of years kind of like uh you know uh if you're growing grape vines for wine it takes a couple of years for the grapes to mature it yeah, it, yeah they say it takes a couple of years to get any effect out of it and that might have been because it was a four-month study um that they didn't they found like such low levels but i yeah, hope, i yeah. hope they keep it, it, uh, it could be a time factor yeah, yeah i i totally agree uh yeah and well hopefully they keep uh they keep those plants going and and more studies come out of that that greenhouse I went to a conference in Florida, and the last day of the conference, they had uh, late in the day, they were going to give a tour of the facility, but I had a family issue. I had to get back here, so I didn't stay for the tour of the uh, growing okay. facility, uh, which I wish I had. I would love to see it. There was a sleep problem study that you were on with uh, uh, Dr. Singh. He was, the, I think yeah. he was the lead on that. Um it said uh, fairly heavy kratom consumers had trouble sleeping and had moderate to severe pain when stopping kratom. Why does that? Why does that happen? Why does uh, I mean? Why does pain happen when they stop? Is it is it maybe a dependency well, issue? It, my guess is, and this is a simple idea, but it seems to hold true. And I I try to emphasize this when I teach pharmacology uh, to my students, and our bodies tend to adapt to the presence of drugs. And when somebody, say, uses opioids for a while, uh, one of the things that can happen if they abruptly stop, they'll have withdrawal symptoms, but they can also have increased pain sensitivity and it's not just part of the withdrawal syndrome, it's hyperalgesia where their sensitivity to pain increases. Hmm. And that's one of the unwanted effects of chronic treatment with drugs is you get these rebound effects that are in the opposite direction. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, Kratom, uh, the people are using it probably at significant doses. And when they try to go off, they have the rebound pain. Now, some of the pain might have been just kratom withdrawal, and some might be real hyperalgesia. I don't know that we distinguish. We, we didn't distinguish that in the study. And it said most regular users in traditional context knew how to self-treat their kratom withdrawal symptoms. Um, that seems like it seems like sort of a cultural thing because they've been using it for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they, how do they self-treat? Uh, withdrawal. I think a lot of them use benzodiazepines, actually. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the uh, the study, but uh, drug sales in, I'm not sure in Malaysia, but a lot of countries, the drugs aren't as restricted as they are in the U.S. Some countries are far more restrictive, uh, I agree, mm -hmm. but... Uh, benzodiazepines, my understanding, are pretty readily available. Uh, so I, I would suspect that's one of the main drugs they use, or main groups of drugs. I had another question about um, a lot of psychiatrists are recommending uh, if somebody comes to them and says, says I'm addicted to Kratom, uh, they're, they want to treat them with 
uh, maybe their withdrawal with buprenorphine or suboxone. Uh, yeah. What do, what do you think of that? Is, is there, that? There are, you know, enough case reports that, you know, say that works and it probably does. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is, and it's one of the reasons there's such a demand for Kratom, access to things like uh, buprenorphine and, you know, suboxone is a product that can- contains buprenorphine mm-hmm. uh, and other drugs like methadone. Access to those drugs is really restricted. It's hard for people to get them. Yeah. And a lot of people who use uh, buprenorphine, uh, it, it's only a weak opioid, a partial opioid agonist. So it's, it doesn't produce much of uh, a high, if you will. And a lot of addicts have trouble staying on sub- buprenorphine products. Uh, so it, it, it works, I have no doubt. But are there other treatments? Uh, I have recently reviewed a couple of case reports with other potential treatments. I can't divulge those because the papers haven't been published and uh, I haven't even seen the final editorial decision Mm -hmm. on one of the papers. But there are possibly other approaches. If you think about the pharmacology of the mitragynines, you know, they do affect opioid receptors to a certain degree, but that's yeah. not their only actions. And they have so many other effects. A drug like buprenorphine is going to mainly target the opioid receptor mediated effects mm-hmm. of Kratom. And I don't know that it would help with any other effects that have different underlying mechanisms. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense because we were actually just I just recorded another podcast today with uh, um, the Journal Club podcast that we do about um, a study where they looked at all the receptors that the different alkaloids were binding to. And a lot of them were uh, like adrenergic receptors. So some of the stimulant properties, I guess, are are from that. that, That's it. It's weird in pharmacology again i've been teaching this for 40 years over 40 years and you know students uh patients they like to know what what the drug does and how it does it yeah and in pharmacology you know one of the things we teach the students is mechanism of drug action well in psychopharmacology in particular it's becoming clear that a lot of drugs that we used to think would have a, a, a single mechanism of action probably have multiple effects. And the classic ones would be the antidepressants. Uh, you know, when I was in graduate school in the 1970s, we were thought depression was caused by a deficiency of norepinephrine and serotonin and uh, inhibiting the metabolism with MAO inhibitors would raise the level of the transmitters and that would make depression better or giving in the, in that day, the only antidepressants other than MAO inhibitors were tricyclic antidepressants and they inhibit the synaptic reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin or serotonin and not so much norepinephrine. Uh, the bottom line is we now know that there are many other things going on. For example, when drugs like tricyclic antidepressants are used over time, the receptors actually adapt, the receptors for the neurotransmitters. There are changes in synaptic organization of the brain. So there's new new synapses formed. Uh, There's actually some neuronal growth that occurs. There's neurotrophic factors uh, that are released so the mechanism of action is much more complicated than it was back in 1975. It's mm-hmm. the same drug. In 75, we knew exactly how the drugs worked. But now that we know a lot more about the drugs, we don't know so much about how they work. <laughs> so I tell the students, I'll list 10 biochemical actions of an antidepressant. You tell me how those effects add up to the improvement in mood of a depressed patient. And I don't think anybody can do that. 
we're just not there in the state of the knowledge. The brain is kind of a complicated organ. Yeah, it, you, the, the point about, you know, multiple drug effects, I think it's true with Kratom. Yeah. Uh, there are new antipsychotic drugs that are being introduced that have, you know, multiple mechanisms of action. And, you know, they're referred to as dirty drugs. And it doesn't mean they're good or bad. It just means they have multiple effects. And our tendency, I think, is to think that multiple effects will complicate things, but we're now finding that these multiple effects probably can add up for positive benefits in patients. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, I, what is uh, Dr. Shea calls it an entourage effect, yeah. uh, rather than the, it, yeah, and is that, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that, that kind of, is that maybe why the, the uh, alkaloids haven't been developed into a, a pharmaceutical drug um, because I know like the the one paper from the 70s it was the precursor to GlaxoSmithKline I forget what they were called then um, but they did a study on mitragyny and they found their one of their conclusions was it it looks like it has the same uh, effect as morphine without the side effects so it was like well why didn't GlaxoSmithKline develop that into a drug is it maybe because uh you know that the plant does just fine but by, by itself and they can't really compete with yeah, that yeah, yeah. I, I think it's probably economics uh mm -hmm. you know why would anybody pay for you know an expensive drug you know say in a tablet or capsule form if they can buy a drug that does the same thing in you know say an herbal product that yeah. does the exact same thing for a fraction of the price. So there's probably economic, uh, you know, who would pay for something that grows on trees? I know other people over the years have applied for patents on developing drugs based on a Kratom. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to get that type of patent approved or awarded um, I, it can be done. I mean, there are drugs that have been developed from natural products. I'm thinking of tamoxifen, the anti-cancer drug from the Pacific U tree. Uh, you know, so it is possible, but it's not easy. I know some of the patent applications were denied because, you know, the argument was you can't patent a plant. But I know people have patented things in the past that are derived from plants. So I'm not yeah. sure of the technicalities there. My hope for Kratom is that somehow it will be regulated. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think with regulation, there would be standards to protect the consumer uh, so that when people buy a product, they can be pretty sure that it meets federal standards, that it is what it claims to be. It's not adulterated with other drugs. It's not contaminated with ridiculous levels of toxic metals. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it has to be completely free of metals. Uh, you know, when we use oregano in our spaghetti sauce or marinara sauce, uh, there are toxic metals and germs. There are microbes in herbs and spices that we use all the time, mm -hmm. uh, but they're regulated. There are standards for what the microbial burden, what the metal burden have to be. Uh, they have to be within certain limits. And the federal agencies have standards for most products. Uh, I think that the move to withdraw the proposal to schedule the mitragynines as schedule one I think it signals that the uh, federal agencies are more willing to look at the science of Kratom and make a decision. And if it's found to be, you know, something that has useful properties, it might have some toxicities, but the benefits outweigh the potential risk. And we can come up with standards to identify what an acceptable product would be, what would be acceptable dosing and uh, regulate. I mean, we've managed to regulate some pretty 
dangerous drugs without making them schedule one substances. The best is nicotine. That's the best mm. example. I mean, people could buy nicotine gums, nicotine patches, uh, and it's a powerful drug. If we could do that with nicotine, we could do it with caffeine. Uh, mm -hmm. Why can't we do it with Kratom and the mitragynines? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the uh, Kratom Consumer Protection Act that the uh, American Kratom Association is trying to pass. Yeah, so it'll be, be interesting to see what states... I, I, I'm not sure of the, all the states that have done this, but it, it, it's interesting. Some of the states that have passed the Protection Act are states that you don't think as being real progressive of or progressive in the area of drug use and drug abuse. Yeah. But they are protecting consumers by regulating Kratom. They're not banning it. They're regulating it, which it'll be interesting to see what standards are adapted in those particular states and see what works and what doesn't. And maybe it can be adopted at the federal level. I've enjoyed talking with you, Brian. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think you're doing a great job with the website. I, I appreciate the, it. With the podcasts, uh, it, I found them very informative, and uh, I'm going to keep following what you're doing. And, uh, I appreciate it. If I can ever help in the future, let me know. Yeah, I, I consider myself in this whole Kratom issue, you know, I'm 68 years old. I'm nearing the end of what I think has been a pretty good career, and rather than just being a Kratom advocate, I'm trying to be an objective third-party evaluator. Yeah. Uh, as an educator, I think I can take that position. And, you know, I do think that Kratom shows so much promise. We have to move ahead with research, and it could be a very important development, especially with our drug abuse crisis going on. I think we need to tell the truth if we're doing this research, which is really exploding right now, and we find something that's troubling as scientists, we have to talk about it. And, uh, you know, I, I was almost glad I found the toxic metals because, yeah. <laughs> you know, too many Kratom advocates are touting it as a wonder drug. And at some point we have to stand back and say, wait a minute, now, is it really as good as it's being touted? And are there any potential problems? And to me, the biggest problem is quality control. The consumers just don't know what they're getting and we need to fix that. You know, the other thing we don't know almost nothing about, what about people with existing health conditions? You know, someone with diabetes or hypertension or, yeah. you know, obesity. You know, like, does any of this affect the response to Kratom or does Kratom have unusual effects in some populations? What about females versus males? Most mm -hmm. users in the surveys that are done are overwhelmingly male. But, yeah, you know, are there differences in responses in males and females? Uh, mm -hmm. Drug interaction issue is huge. Um, and all of this needs to be scientifically investigated. Yeah. Uh, the good thing is the fact that the feds aren't going to immediately ban it is a good thing from a research standpoint, though. I think these studies can move ahead. Yeah. And, oh, and I emailed your son. I'm going to play one of his songs on the podcast, too. Oh, which one are you going to play? Uh, I think it's What's Shaking. Oh, yeah, that's good. That, that was that's a single. A yeah. He's a good young man. I'm really proud of him. Thank you, Dr. Walt Prezelik. Intro music is Rising, Memories of Thailand. The Kratom Science Podcast is written and produced by me, Brian Gallagher, for KratomScience.com. Outro music today is Matt Charles, What's Shaking? MattCharlesBlues.com. Matt Charles Progelic on harmonica. Take care. <laughs>